I think like being prepared. Okay. Where's that timer stuff? So who are our speakers? Raise your hand. Okay. All speeches between 18 and 22 minutes, is that correct? Yes. Set those times, good. So let Ron get the time cards. Make sure all your cell phones are turned on. And in those purple folders are green evaluation forms. If everybody could just take four evaluation forms and help the speakers out, give them some feedback. And then to anybody can fill up green evaluation forms. And then you can take four that would really help out our speakers. And then the blue forms are for just the qualified speakers to vote. So everybody takes the green, the qualified speakers, and the club. You don't have to turn it in. 
is only for your use. Next, when you make this list, just remember to be honest because that's the only way you're going to get the benefit. The first book I'm going to open in my classroom is Do You Let Your Limitations Limit You? Do you let your limitations limit you? We're going to turn the page. We're going to look at the life of Loretta Claiborne. Loretta was teased terribly, taunted by her classmates. She was told, you can never do anything right. You cannot keep up with any of the subjects. She believed them. She carried that weight. One day, the coach said, Loretta, why don't you come for track and field? Okay, when Loretta got on the track and felt the wind blowing against her skin, Loretta was free. Loretta had found a place where she could do something right. It changed her thinking, it changed her behavior, it changed her Loretta played. 1970, Loretta went to a Special Olympics. She didn't know what to expect. She went. She has never regretted that day. She met many other people like herself with special needs. Loretta didn't just participate that year, one year, two years three years, she continued to be part of that group. She had found her home. She became an advocate, an outspoken person on behalf of those with special needs. Special Olympics was created to provide training and competition for those with mental disabilities. Loretta Claiborne, became so famous she started running marathons. There were stories written about her. Everybody was talking about Loretta Clayton. President Bill Clinton invited her to jog with him. We all know President Clinton, he liked to jog. Well, she turned him down. <laughs> she turned the President of the United States down. Ladies and gentlemen, why? She had made a commitment to a friend that she was going to attend their program. Would you or I turn down the President of the United States? Loretta Clayton, a courageous woman. Loretta had real limitations, real success. Do you let your limitations move? Let's turn the page and see oh, David Green. David is a Christian evangelist. Well known, a speaker in high demand. In 1953, when he was born, his brain was deprived of oxygen for 18 minutes, resulting in cerebral palsy. David had a loving family. He was teased and teased and teased and teased by fellow students. When he went home, his mama said, you are perfect. You are perfect just the way you when David was 11, his father died. It was okay because he still had his mama. At the age of 14, she died. He did not want to live. She was his mom. 
She was the glue that held his life together. His, one of his sisters decided, I'm not going to give up on David because he just did not want to live. She kept inviting him to go to church. Of course, David said, no. Come to church. No. Come to church. No. He finally gave in because you know when somebody keeps bugging you, eventually, eventually, you're going to say yes. Slowly but surely, he found a reason to go on. Today, he speaks around the country. He is a husband and a father. One of the things David loves to say is, none of my children have cerebral <clears throat> David is someone I love to hear speak. I could never hear him speak and not leave feeling inspired and encouraged. A question that he has left with thousands of people, I have What's your excuse? David Ray, real limitations, real success. Well, I think I'll close this book. Open another book. This book is my life. On a Saturday night, when it was raining, I came into the world. We all think of sunshine, but on my day, it was raining. My mom and dad, as my mother was telling me this story, says that she and my dad were playing cards with family and friends, which was their usual Saturday night. Whenever someone starts telling a story about your childhood or the day you were born, you start feeling warm and fuzzy, and you can't wait to hear the love that's about to be poured on you. My mother continued this story, and I was really interested because she rarely ever shared the story. She continued to say, and I was drunk. My warm cousin cuddly feelings started to leave me because I know what I'm in for because of the person that she is. She continued, she never noticed that my body stiffened or that I turned within. She continued. I drank the whole nine months I carried you. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to know this. But I did what I did with everything. I stuffed it. I stuffed it. I stuffed it deep down inside me. Thus, the beginning of my life. My mom and dad were married 11 years before I was born. Three years later came my good, handsome, and close friend brother. <laughs> They were married 11 years before I came along, three years later. He came along. They divorced when I was seven and my brother was four. What did my mother do? She married another alcoholic. Let me tell you, there are stories that you do not want to hear. During that time, we always had parties at home. Friday night, my brother and I would not get any sleep until the wee hours in the morning. Why? Because everybody was loud, cursing, and in the living room, just having a stormy good time. One Saturday night, I was 14. I walked in to the kitchen. And lying on the floor was my mom on her back. One of my cousins was on top.
top of her with a knife to her throat. I didn't scream for an adult to come. I didn't panic. I slowly kneeled down on the floor next to my cousin. I said, I know she's been taunting you all night, teasing you, humiliating you. I heard her over and over and over, and she wouldn't back off. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. Please give me the knife. Please. I don't know how many times I said that. I don't know how many times that was repeated. And finally she gave me the money. I stuffed and stuffed and stuffed all my feelings down deep, deep, deep within stuff myself. There was no place else to take me. I knew in my mind that I needed hope to survive to be 18. The hope for me was twofold. One, I found the Lord when I was a little girl, and I knew he would never leave me or forsake me. And I also had hope that at the age of 18, I would be responsible for myself and live my life. <clears throat> a couple of months before I graduated from high school, I got a job at the phone company. I graduated on Thursday, I have you know, and went to work on Monday. No messing around this chick. That was the beginning to me of my life. Age of 18. I continued to enjoy what I thought was an opportunity for me to stand up, to live my life the way I always saw it in my head. I always saw it in my head what my life would be. First thing I did was I joined the gym. Yes, at 18 I joined the gym. <laughs> Why are you doing that, Shirley? I weighed 115 pounds. It was two loves, jazzercise, encompass music, and dance, which I love. My 19th birthday was coming up, and I thought I should do something special. So I went to Hawaii for my 19th birthday. I was so tickled, I cannot tell you how tickled I was. I continued to get more and more and more emotions on my job, and soon became a supervisor. My family was so proud of me, and my friends. I didn't understand why they were so proud of me at the time. You know why? Because I was doing what everybody did. Don't all people live their lives? Don't all people go for the gusto? I decided also at 22 to add on my driver's license as an organ donor. That's right. And with me, I tell everybody, I ask my girlfriend, come do this with me. This is so exciting. She says, you're in your organ for way? What am I going to do with them once I'm dead? I don't need them anymore. And I'm still, I don't really know, it's on my license. As I continue to see that the world is a huge place, I went to Bermuda, New York, New York. Just wanted to do everything and go everywhere. The age of 26, I bought a home as a single woman. Ooh -wee. I have a picture of my first home in my mind that will never be lost. I see it exactly the way it was that day that I moved in. Well, let's move into the <coughs> next generation of my life. I was a mom divorced with two sons. And I thought to myself, well, what can I do to give them everything in the world? I took them to the opera, to the museum, 
You know they were excited, right? You know they said, Mom, let's go to the opera, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> I took them anyway. We traveled. We stayed in San Diego many times. I took my kids to the Grand Canyon. We flew to Orlando, Florida, the Disney World. The best trip that we took together was one I'll never forget. We toured Italy together. They called us the three peas in pop. To sit on the stone bench of the Coliseum was just overwhelming. I read about it. Never thought I would sit inside the Coliseum. Go through the spooky catacombs, and they are spooky. They're real dark in there. <laughs> to walk through the Vatican, be standing and looking at this wall. You can see the top of it in the middle of the city. To tour all of the ancient churches of Rome. To walk on a city that floats, that's Venice. We had an absolutely fabulous time. And yes, I have hundreds of pictures. I could not understand something that was happening in my life. I'm a problem solver. I'm a go-getter. And I found myself sometimes sad and I couldn't understand. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't touch it. I couldn't measure it. It was there. I felt there was in a dark well and there was no way out. After a Thanksgiving family get together, my mother showed out as only an alcoholic can show out. And we really went at it. I survived that weekend. Got to work Monday. Sitting at the desk. I always like to get there early because it's more relaxing. I fell apart. I started crying uncontrollably and I just could not, could not, could not get a grip. I called the emergency hotline to have a counseling house. Talked for 20 minutes. Ended up making an appointment. She ended the appointment by asking me, do you feel suicidal? I said, no. I'll be fine until my first appointment. That appointment led me to a turning point. I turned a corner in my life. I joined ACA, Adult Children of Alcoholics. Very much white AA is to help adult children. That was extremely emotional, very difficult. It took a lot out of me because I was forced to pull out every single thing that I had buried all my life. I needed to do it. When I came out of that program, I was very proud of myself. That program involved individual counseling, group counseling, and education. I called my brother. I wanted him to go. I thought it would help. And he said to me, I don't need it. I don't need it. Yet this is the person who has no childhood. We were so traumatized, my brother will never, ever speak of his childhood. Never. I could do two things with my mother. I could either cut her out of my life after this class, this program, or set boundaries. I set boundaries because I didn't know how to get rid of her. I wish I could tell you I knew how to get rid of my mom, but I don't know how to get rid of her. And I have spent the last 34 years of my life 
dealing with her. She stopped drinking. Even without drinking, she's crude and sensitive and really has no idea how to communicate. The drinking just made those personality traits what? intensify. I cannot find the words to tell you how I've dealt with her since my dad died. And I have replaced him in many ways because she's not, she's not independent. There's no words to express to you that without God on my side, hope, belief, and forgiveness, I wouldn't be able to do it. I know you guys at this point are thinking, is she going to keep talking about herself? It's not about me. It's about you. My life, real limitations, real success. Do you let your limitations limit you? Pull out that list and take a look at it. Give yourself a gift. Revisit. Class dismissed.
motivating all of us to do the same. Please welcome Offie Bill with Seeing a Challenge as an Opportunity.
You said the gate? Which gate? I was unaware. You recognize this. This is called a medical ID bracelet. I just had a seizure. Can you just explain a little bit more? Look, I, just explain all that to the cop. Mm -hmm. Sit there. Okay. I couldn't trigger any blood or any understanding in her heart. This didn't trigger. They didn't respect this. And the cops did show up. The cops came on and, I mean, did you purposely push that boy? <laughs> I had to go through all the questions with them. No, sir. I didn't purposely push any boy. What boy was it? I don't even know who you're talking about. What is his name? As much as I tried to inspire them that way, I showed this medical ID bracelet, adamantly explained the situation, mm -hmm. didn't really get a lot of love in their hearts. So they said, okay, I answered all their questions. They took my hand, walked me over here to the door, said, all right, you can go ahead and leave. That was my first and my last day of work over there. <laughs> and the principal who understood this bracelet just hadn't been here that day. And any time that you do anything at LAUSD, you can't fix that. Because that was, that was why my first day was my, also my last day. She couldn't fix that for me later on. <sighs> Repeat this with me. Free your mind. Free your mind. The rest will follow. The rest, the rest will follow. follow. That's very true. Take that deep breath. When we take those deep breaths, just picture everything that you want accomplished, just all of the goals that you want. Picture it. You realize all that you want. Just blow out all that negativity. Blow out everything that doesn't work. And you realize exactly what you want. You know your goals. And realize how 2014 is already about to be you. You're going to write those New Year's resolutions down again. So you know what you're passionate about. Just focus on that. Stay fine-tuned and understand what you really want. And keep going forward with it. Don't get lost and sidetracked. Just stay focused. Make sure you're going for it. And taking all of your steps. <laughs> Keep your mind free and clear and understand that all the challenges that you get are fine-tuning your skills. <coughs> it's fine-tuning. And it's giving you a lot of strength. Because I love thinking about that butterfly. You know how that butterfly doesn't just drop into this earth and start flying around. You realize how many steps it's got to take? I love that major step. The one step that I admire most about it breaking out of that cocoon. It literally has to fight to get out of that cocoon. And that's how it's building all of the muscles for its wings. Now that it's got all the strength, flying around. It's taking some more steps. I know that's not the final one. But now that it's able to gain strength and fly around, it saw everything that it gained from breaking out of that cocoon. All the major skills that it gained from that. I'm looking at my challenge. I've had this for 16 years. I'm fine-tuning my skills to do this. I am obviously gaining a lot. It's been a journey. But it came on me my freshman year of college. In 97, out of the blue, this comes on me. Nobody in my family has this at all. Nobody. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, this comes on me. Because really, I was just feeling some deja vu and feeling a little tingling on my stomach. Y'all, be careful what you hear or listen to with them doctors. Because my parents took me to the doctor and he said, ah, don't you know you're having a seizure? Here you go. Here's some Dilantin. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's bogus. Be careful about them doctors. 
<laughs> ay, ay, ay. I'll get on that one with Julia later on, but I'm ignoring that. I listen to them, and that's what triggered me to see. It was only day job to them. But I still stayed focused to make sure I graduated college, got my bachelor's in business, because that was my major, major goal. I always wanted to operate the business and be a business woman, be an entrepreneur. That's been an example that I've had with my family. And I thought that I was going to be able to walk into corporate America. That would be the first step, right? I would be able to get the experience that way. But I was ex very disappointed when folks in America didn't want to welcome me in. <laughs> I was like, well, I got my experience with my BBA. Uh, I'm a bad and cool lot. You look for mine. No. Okay, Avi, let's free our mind. We gotta do another step. Let me see what else I can do. And my mentor got me really motivated when she told me about the Peace Corps. How that would give me a lot of world travels. And mm -hmm. You know me, I love to travel. And I would be able to go around the world and see a lot of things. I quickly wrote out my essays and jumped on that interview and felt great when they accepted me. And they said, Avi, we'll be able to send you off in 30 to 45 days. You'll know how well you'll do out there. Why don't you just fill out that last sheet for us? Just fill out that last one. And then you'll be on your way. And I'm looking forward to it. I told you I follow my rules very well. So that's the thing there I learned. <laughs> Careful about what you say. Because I followed the rules and told them all the details on that sheet. I told them what medicine I took. Mm -hmm. As soon as I told them that, hi, 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 the response was not helping. That's what they told me because part of that response there. You got responses that you didn't like? And they quickly came back to me. Oh, I'm sorry. We won't be able to handle you in the other countries. We can't do that. We won't be able to send you up over there. We can't. I was thinking about some words. What words did I trigger it? All I have to do is follow my medicine. That won't be no big deal. Relax. That didn't work, though. What can I free my mind with? Y'all remember that song from Invo? Free your mind, and the rest will follow. <laughs> I love that song. Yes, I was singing it. Kept me free in my mind. I clearly was thinking, what's the next step? I clearly have to do another step. I clearly have to win this thing. And that's one thing that really got me motivated was Urban Magic Johnson. He kept his mind free. I was like, that's a good model for me. How many of you are Laker lovers like me in here? <laughs> oh, goodness, excuse me. <laughs> the Laker ball to you. <laughs> and I'm from here, this is the W. I'm a West Coast person. Mm -hmm. I was out there in Howard, in D.C., throwing my W up. <laughs> 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 but was fun. I got to show them how to dance. I'm always right. My Lakers take care of me. And I was proud because Urban Magic Johnson stepped into the Lakers when I joined. When I grew up, he was in the, no, he came in in 79 when I was born. And so I was always able to follow him. He had the bomb team, because that was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, James Worthy, oh, Michael Cooper. They were working together with those Lakers. Mm -hmm. Five NBA championships. <laughs> yes, that's why I was happy about my Lakers. They take care of me. But that's why I was shocking for him. In 91, he had to abruptly retire because of HIV. He got to quickly pull out because of HIV. And think about the 90s. HIV was a horrific word. You can't even say it out loud like that. HIV. <laughs> HIV. How do you think he got that? <laughs> uh -huh. Strong though, he was gonna make sure he got healed and became the spokesman for AIDS. He became that spokesman, and you realize how we all speak about AIDS right now? 
and it's no big deal. AIDS and HIV is welcome. He showed me how you go out there and spread the word about things. We hear it over and over again, and everybody's aware. I think you need to do the same thing. I need to spread the word about epilepsy, about seizures. Many of you don't understand. Because how many of you have actually seen a complex partial seizure? Okay, a couple of hands. People who there know. But how many of you have seen the grandma seizures? That's the standard seizure that's been accepted throughout lifetime. The grandmas, where somebody will fall down and shake. They'll be shaking, they'll be all over the ground. They can be biting their tongue, but they'll be all on the ground. It's obvious. That's a grandma seizure. And that's been accepted out throughout lifetime. They even had in the Bible that story with Jesus in Mark 9, with that man right now. Oh, can you please heal my son? Some demons are on you. You know, all these things all throughout lifetime, we've heard about grandma seizures. But it wasn't until the 19th century where the EEG came out that you actually found out about the other trouble seizures. Simple partial, where you'll be in a trance. Or complex partial, where you're still in a trance. Your eyes are wide open, but you're doing all kinds of weird moves. That's what I tell you, a dozen gentleman saw me on the street. I didn't tell you, but he saw me on the street having one. He said, oh, I, I thought you were just hot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you had to see. And the RN tells me, tell you all how seizures, these complex partial, just looks like a medical or mental illness. It's clearly a mental illness. It's not a physical thing. It's clearly a mental so All those moves. <laughs> it's a mental thing. So that's probably why those teachers got all scared. If you ever see me doing any weird spins and there's no music going on, <laughs> I'm not dancing, <laughs> but you see some spins going on, there's no music, I might probably be in a seizure right now. If I'm not responding to you, Go ahead and sit me down. Sit me down. Ask me a generic question over and over again. I think, when was your birthday? I think, when did you eat for lunch? Just ask me that question over and over again. And when I can answer your question, when I can start actually holding a conversation with you, I'll come back to my consciousness. <coughs> now I'm on the same page with you. And the ball's in your court. Because 99.9% .9 of the time, I want to know just what happened. Because I'm <laughs> what, what happened? Why is everybody giving me this eye? Or I was on the bus. Why am I sitting over here on the stand here? Why am I, I was at Walmart. Why am I over here on the third floor? What happened? I need all of you to explain. The ball's in your court. And I agree with Robert Kiyosaki. I agree with Robert Kiyosaki. I'm looking for the time I haven't seen the time. He was telling me to exercise the muscles of your brain. And that's why I said that challenge there is where I'm being the ambassador. I'm making sure that all of you are aware of the different stories. Because living free with epilepsy is clearly what's going on. And you'll see that one. Because you think about that gentleman, Julius Caesar. You think that he's been living free with epilepsy? Because he actually was free. He had complex partial seizures. But he kept his mind free and clear. And Julius Caesar was way back there in BC. He was born in 100 BC, all the way to, four, yeah, I want to say 44 BC. But he was a Roman. They called him the military genius who never lost a war and was able to help the Roman society go and gain all of its strength from those wars and build the Roman Empire. They loved him a lot. And he gained, you know, his first was consul, he was doing all that military thing in the BC for 60, all the way got his big old politician thing in 48. But long and short, he had the seizures. And as the baby was saying, those are so, a lot of his friends were saying, um, 
He's just in that trance. We just can't talk to him right now. No, he didn't let that hold him down. He kept his mind free and clear. So this journey that we're all on, you're fine-tuning your skill. And it's clearly a journey. You can get a lot more stories right here in this book. And think about that gentleman who just was in transition with us. Nelson Mandela, how he was focused for those 27 years he was in prison. And he came out knowing he was going to be the spokesman for aid for South Africa. But I love how he won the Nobel Peace Prize before he got to be the South African president. That just got me motivated, how before he won the president, the whole world saw him. And so I'm telling myself, I think, this has simply been 16 years. Simply stay focused. I'm just telling all of y'all about the journey. It's clearly been one. And it's gotten very well. Because I've told you how I understand how everybody needs to be on the same page. Because I've been on those dates. Well, I didn't tell people before. Mm -hmm. I was on that good date with that six foot three gentleman I was looking for it for. My first date with him, I didn't tell him. And then all of a sudden, we're on the shoulder of the freeway, not moving. Mm -hmm. That was my first and last date with him. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I make sure that I share all this immediately with all the guys who want to talk to me. They know about my seizures, they know about the struggle, and all of you need to be aware about the different forms. So just, you'll understand. Understand the different forms of seizures, but understand your challenge. Understand how you're fine-tuning your skills with your challenge. You are strengthening yourself tremendously. I look forward to hearing all that you're gaining. Yes. Okay, thank you, Afi. Can we please have some evaluation? Afi, you're wonderful, you're charming. Uh, you gave us information about something I really didn't know anything about. And yet, your topic was, what was it, uh, seeing a challenge as an opportunity. I would love you just to tell us about you know, the different kinds of epilepsy. And tell us, when you talked about, it was very much toward the end of the speech, and you talked about what happened to you, what we can do for you, uh, so that when we see somebody that's having the kind of seizure you're having, we can not just assume that they're drunk, but that we can assume, oh, maybe she has the same thing Afi has. And then, if you focus more on what we can do, we'll be empowered to help that person. I'd be interested to know how often you have it. I'd be interested to know more people than Julius Caesar <coughs> having everything about not how challenges are important to me, I already know that, but something I don't know is everything about this epilepsy and how I can be of help, be knowledgeable about it. I think you've got a fabulous story to move forward. Okay. saying that it was night and day mm -hmm. from the last time you auditioned to this one. So kudos. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. There was one, and I wrote it down because I have no short-term memory, <laughs> and I have no long-term memory, so it's good. But there was just one thing that if you could make a little bit smoother would go a long way. When you were talking about your story and you, you transitioned you transitioned from LAUSD to the Free Your Mind. I didn't understand where you were, were going. 
until a few sentences later when you explained it. I think you just need to rearrange it. So when you talked about, uh, it, this, this affected me, so I had to free my mind because of this, this, and this. Say it with me. Just a little better transition. It was so abrupt, I'm like, wait a minute, she was just telling her story, right? Why am I freeing my mind? Make sense? But it's a, it's a, a small thing, but I think it would add so much to your, to your, to an already mesmerizing story.
is really, really good both days. <laughs> it was a beautiful day, and I looked upon a baseball field. I drove, I got my mom's car and I drove up to a baseball field. And I remember looking, like, like it was yesterday, I looked out over the baseball field. I love playing baseball. And I looked over that baseball field. Now, I knew I had a lot of issues. I had a lot of problems. And I remember that was the first time I ever thought. I went up there. I got my hand looking out at the field and put it like this. And went, Boom. That's the first day I thought about suicide. And that's the first time I had a suicidal thought. And so time went on, and I thought at the time, I said to myself, well, I'm not going to kill myself now, but in five years, I would. I'd give myself until I was 21, because I didn't feel right. I couldn't fit in. I, I just didn't feel part of this earth. So five years, about eight years later, I was laying in the middle of PCH, down in Huntington Beach, I had gotten in a car accident, and I was laying, and the paramedics were, were tearing off my shirt. I had a, a, this purple shirt. I remember like this was yesterday. They're pulling off this shirt, and I go, what are you doing? What are you doing? That's my favorite shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's all I thought about while I'm laying on the ground in the middle of PCH, pulling off my shirt. And, think, what? and I guess later I found out it was blood. And, and, uh, when they did it, the, neuro, the neurosurgeon did an evaluation. He, he uh, after they did the operation on my on my head, they sent me to a psychiatrist because of some of the things I must have been saying. And the psychiatrist told me, he said that was an unconscious suicide attempt <coughs> when you fall asleep at the wheel, which I did. And at the time, I really didn't want to live. Not that I was going to kill myself, but in a way, that's what I attempted to do. So I was very depressed. Now that was a blessing in disguise. Because what happened there is I started to see a doctor. And he said, you got to get your, uh, he, he, you got to get it out. So I started letting it out and everything came up from my uh, very physical abuse, not too similar to Shirley's story a little bit, but a lot of physical abuse and trauma that happened in my childhood, and I started releasing this, and the doctor said, hey, you gotta get your anger out. So he said, get a tennis racket, or a bataka bat, or something, and pound, pound your mother, pound your father. <laughs> and, <it was> <laughs> and, and I started releasing this anger, and, and one thing leads to another, and he, so I, I go back, and I'm starting to feel better, more memories are coming up, and he said, he says, well, you know what? Now that you're doing all this uh, anger work, I want you to take a picture of your mother and go out and shoot her. I went, what? <laughs> you know, people think you're... So I went to the LAX shooting gallery uh, range here. And I took, and they have, uh, they have targets. You can get a target with a picture of a, a hostage, you know, a, a good guy being held. And so I got that, I got that target and I put the picture of my mother on. And then you, you push a button and it goes way out. And I'm starting to, you know, fire away. And the manager of the shooting range comes up and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm just shooting my mother. <laughs> and I can't repeat what he said, but he said, you sick and a B word. <laughs> and I, I looked right at him and I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I got a note from my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kept on getting better and better and better. And then one day, I started the doctor challenge. Now, you got to go out and do stuff. Because, you know, I, was, I still was depressed. He said, you got to do stuff. I said, well, what do you want me to do? Uh, you know, because I, I, I was having a down period at that time, going through some things. He said, just do anything. So I got a book um, written by James Mishner. I don't know if you know, he's a, he's a story, great story writer, one of the famous 
authors of all time, and he wrote a book about Texas. And it's 1,100 pages long. So I started reading it. And I, you know, I was depressed and trying to work through this stuff. And it took me months and months and months. So I finally got near the end. And I was so involved with this story. And it picked up my spirits. And, and you know, when, you, when you're down, you just got to go do something. Dance or read a book, whatever. Just get out there and do something. Uh, so I get near the end of the book. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm going to get depressed again. <laughs> Almost done with this story. And I, start, I actually started to worry. And, and then luckily I found out he wrote other books. <laughs> Alaska, the Caribbean, South Tales of South Pacific. And, the thing. and there's 48 states on a lot of countries. As long as he keeps writing, I'll stay alive. <laughs> no, so, but it kept on, I kept on building strength. Um, but... As things started to happen, I, I, uh, I found out I suffered uh, from post-traumatic stress. And I had a lot of fears. Some, I mean, I, at the time, I started thinking, I've got to start laughing at some of my fears because I had just joined Toastmasters, which was one of my challenges also back then. And I started thinking, I've got I to gotta laugh at because one of my fears was that I was going to get jumped. I always had this fear that I was going to get jumped. And... And another fear I had was a sniper was going to shoot me. And I don't know how it happened, but one night I was looking out uh, outside my balcony, and I thought I saw a red dot <laughs> or something, and I thought the snipers were after me. And anyway, I started dating. Uh, I started dating this woman, and um, she came over, and I could, so I keep all my my curtains closed. So she came over one day, she opens all my curtains up, and. It was daylight, you know, it was, it was, and I thought, man, she's crazy. <laughs> she knows snipers are out there. <laughs> I dumped her. <laughs> no, she always, she always, she, she was really good for me. We, she always wanted to walk hand in hand now, and I thought that was ridiculous, because, you know, I, I want to walk back to back. Hey, honey, I got this guy. <laughs> but the point is, it was... And all the fears and the paranoia had gotten to the point where it wasn't funny before this. I mean, I really looked under the bed. I thought somebody was under the bed, and I would do this religiously. And uh, I just got to tell you one more quick one here, because I know I don't have a lot of time. But I did pick, you know, I, I would used to look under the bed, and I wouldn't see anybody, and there's a lot of stuff. So I'd run over this side of the bed, and I'd look on this side, and it wasn't anybody. And so I thought he was going this way, so I started running back this way, and I actually did this once. I stopped halfway, and I came back to this side because he thought I was going over there. <laughs> I get on here. <laughs> but the point was to, to um, these things were very real, and, and laughter, um, if you can find that for anything. I know everyone in here is probably going through something, especially this time of year. You can find that one little thing that's really bothering you and just try to find a laugh for it. Make, make it ridiculous. As some stand-up comedians, you know, they do. They make the little problem so ridiculous. You've got to laugh at it. Um, but that's a very healing, and that really helped me through uh, that time period to just start laughing at things. Now, I got stronger, and I kept on getting stronger through this whole process, but... Like anything, there comes a, uh, as you get stronger and you make a decision to go on a certain path, um, and it could be, you know, it could be a path that say you, you want to get a divorce, or you feel that you're not right with the person you're with, and you, and you, you keep on going, and then that, that moment of truth comes where you actually, you know, say you're going to get a divorce. For me, it became the moment of truth was that I was going to start to forgive um, my mother as my doctor and a few other people told me to start forgiving her. I think Shirley probably, <laughs> you got to the same, same point at one point where you, where you have to forgive. I mean, it's the only way to move on. Now, now, I got so, so bad. I didn't want to forgive. My ego was so stressed that I would never forgive my mother. For, for doing what she did, and um, but I but I but I knew I had to. But this ambivalence 
um, I call it the moment of truth. This ambivalence of, of forgiving just started driving me crazy. And I actually, um, because I suffered from post-traumatic stress, they thought I was going to have a cardiac arrest. And so it takes like a year and a half to get approved for electroshock treatment. They approved me in three weeks. And they had me. <laughs> and then they said, well, you can get electroshock treatment. And then it took me like six months to finally give in and get it. But I did have seven uh, shock treatments at UCLA uh, to help me through this period because it was so intense. That moment of, well, I can't leave my life with this anger and I gotta let it go and forgive my mother. And that ambivalence and that struggle uh, was tough. And, and I only had uh, seven treatments over two weeks, but it, it, for what I knew about electroshock treatment, it was that <laughs> one flew over the cuckoo's nest uh, Jack Nicholson's, I mean, that classic movie. And so I, I kid the people now, you know, they call those people that had ECT back then uh, crazy people. And now they just call them comedians. <laughs> <laughs> I know, a lot of crazy comedians. Um, but so, so during that whole time, the, uh, they did, dur during the shock treatment, um, when I went to UCLA to get it, I'll tell you a little bit more about what it did for me. But I was in this room, and the nurse was putting all the, it was a good looking nurse too, she was almost my age. And she's putting all these electrodes on my head, and I'm laying down, and um, you know, electroshock treatment is they apply a little bit of current to shock, uh, to the run through your, uh, your, your hemisphere here, to help you forget things. So, and, 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 and that wipes out your memory a little bit, so you can start uh, healing. You can start like working things out. That's the, that's the purpose of it. So anyway, she's, I'm on this table and I'm laying down. She's putting all these electrodes on, and I remember like it was yesterday. Because all I was thinking was, how do I get her number? <laughs> how do I get her phone number. And each each time she was the same nurse, so I thought, oh, I can't wait for my next shot. <laughs> I'll see her. <laughs> Don't look at the right side of things. <laughs> no, but I did. Um, um, I did. Um, it did help me get through that period, and I really am an advocate of shock treatment with therapy. Not some of the ways they do it now. They do it over and over again and keep on doing it. I'm not a fan of that because it really messes up your brain. But uh, in a in a small interval of time with therapy as a, an extra tool along with pills and so forth, antidepressant, is very effective, and especially if you have a moment of truth like I did where I had all that ambivalence and struggle. Um, so at that time, um, I gotta tell you right now though, I do, I did get all my memory back. You know, that's, you know, I, uh, I not too long after that either, everything came back and, and I felt, you know, I felt a lot better. I got through that that struggle. Um, so I, I got to say, um, I love I love being here in Tokyo. This is <laughs> I love your city. I hear a lot of American English speaking people out there. And, yeah, it's great getting that memory back. You know. Not really, really healthy. So um, as far as the suicidal thoughts I had, though. Uh, they disappeared uh, many years ago, but during the time, uh, there is a big stigma. I mean, it took me six months by the time they told me about electroconvulsive shock treatment to actually do it, because in my mind, I said, man, it's for crazy people. It's for crazy, it's the stigma that goes with it. Suicidal thoughts, well, I look at suicidal thoughts now, it's just a fantastic opportunity to choose between living and dying. And if you're given that choice, every time you have a thought, you strengthen your, your choice, your live. You know, you, you strengthen that. It, it gives you a, uh, a sense of confidence. And uh, I don't know when my suicidal thoughts disappeared, but uh, there wasn't like a timer going off in my iPhone or anything. <laughs> it was like having the flu. It was just gone. And, and thank God. Uh, so now I'm going out and speaking about it, and especially trying to be a little more of an advocate for ECT. Um, and also to try to uh, lessen the stigma of depression and, uh, and suicidal thoughts. Um, 
and post-traumatic stress also because veterans are coming back uh, to a very tough situation. I, I sort of relate as so far as some of the feelings I've had from post-traumatic stress, but in a different in a different area. But with the suicide, the um, one thing I would do would walk around. I don't know how many uh, by raise of hands have, has known anybody that's been suicidal. A lot of people. Okay. So you know, people that don't know someone suicidal, it's it's like I was working at the time. I was working. Uh, and I would just go about things matter-of-factly uh, through my day, and then I would think about, like, after work, I would think about writing a suicide note. And then, but the biggest thing that came with, with me, I would just do this matter-of-factly, just like I'm speaking to you now. It was just like a normal process. I remember one time I thought about my boss gave me a project, and it was on a, I think it was due on a, uh, of like a Friday at the end of work, or maybe it was Monday morning, I can't remember. But I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Oh, it's a report. And I'm not going to do this report because, you know, I, I'm going to kill myself this weekend, so uh, oh, why do it, you know? But then came Monday, and what am I going to do? I tell my boss, you're not going to believe this excuse. I've <laughs> never heard this excuse before. <laughs> That is one of my one of my passions is try. I know in the in the heat of things you can't laugh at certain things. You know, you, you're you're just thinking about you know serious stuff. And I'm going to try to bring this to people to to certain groups, especially veterans and so forth, to, to see if I can get you know get people get uh, an awareness of people laughing or not to figure out that too much. But I like to bring the, the message. Um, across that uh, find, find that laughter, find, find that little hope inside there. So with all that said, there is one other thing that I, I'd like to talk about uh, with, with all this. There, there's uh, four phases I went through. The, the first phase was the depression. And uh, the second phase was the fears and uh, what I call reality testing. I think, I think that's the most important phase of, of, of anything is the reality testing, the challenge to not just sit around. That's when I got involved with Toastmasters and, and other things around, around that time, to go out and, and do something. Um, so, and, and any challenge we have in life, you know, we, can, we can sit around and not do something. But that, that phase is one of the most important, is to get out and, and do something. And whatever, whatever's facing, facing you or anything, um, getting out and doing something will help you, just like the anger release or, or uh, reading a book or anything, get, get your mind off, get away from it. And that, that'll give you that effect of uh, being able to work things, things through. Uh, another, the other phase, the third phase I went through was uh, the moment of truth. And that is, the, that is the moment of truth where you make a decision, this is what I'm going to do. And, and, and then you start putting your energy, and uh, even though it's very difficult and sometimes difficult to get through that period, that is uh, that is the time when your energy starts coming once you make that decision. And then the last phase is what what I call the healing phase, and that is the phase I'm in now to to speak about it, to heal, uh, to pass on the word as we all as speakers are trying to do to help other people uh, in get through their similar uh, situations. And I must say, the healing phase is uh, is the funnest. <laughs> so it's good to be here right now. And I got one last thing. I want to end it right here on one last thing. I forgave my mother, and I'll be going back to see her on the 26th. We have a good we have a good relationship. She she wrote me a letter thanking for forgiving forgiving her, and I believe that forgiveness is the greatest form of love. Madam um, President.
I love this presentation. I love that you uh, have owned what you've gone through and decided that you wanted to share it with us. A couple things for me. Toward the end, you told us about the four phases that you went through. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because throughout your speech, you touched on a lot of things. And I felt that you were, you know, there were a lot of stories. And at one point, I was kind of a little difficult following you. Possibly, if you would take those four phases, and for each phase, talk about a specific moment in your life that relates to that phase, that might help us to keep along on your journey. Also, too, you had a lot of great uh, comedic input. And I thought when you said uh, that, you know, it's great being here in Tokyo, I thought that was your ending. I was like, great, he's ending. But then you kept going on. And I didn't know also, too, whether you kept going on because you couldn't find the timer and you didn't know where she was or he was. And so, because it seemed like you were almost trying to fill time. So just kind of want to watch that and just kind of have your information, your stories, your vignettes. Base, if you base them on the four phases that you've gone through, that would help us. But I love your stories. I love that you were able to take what you were going through and, like you said, add the laughter so that we can laugh with you but still understand the importance of what you went through. Thank you. inspiring and I love that you kept it conversational with, with us. You get our attention, your audience, and you get it, uh, between, you know, the, the ball rolling between your stories and us. You tell your story, bring it back to us and give an example. And then you conclude it with a summary of the phases and what, what helps. Uh, so that, that was excellent. Um, about uh, finishing your speech with I'm here in Tokyo, if you want to give it as a humorous speech, that would be okay. But if you're giving it as an inspirational, motivational speech, uh, I love the statement you finish with. So you need to finish it with a memorable statement that your audience leave with. Uh, I would invite you to choose a different, a little bit different uh, statement that goes back to your message, main message, your speech, your title, speech title, which is challenge, it's an opportunity in this, this case. But overall, it's an excellent speech and a big, big plus, the humor that you have, that will always connect your audience. And I wish your, my brother had heard your speech. He committed suicide nine years ago. Um, so I can fully agree. I have one question for Jeff. Jeff, did your mother forgive you for using her for target practice? <laughs> hey, serious, true story. She, she, when she, uh, I started getting into the punching and all that and told her about what I was doing, she bought me for Christmas one year, she bought me a punching bag, little one. <laughs> and they, uh, so she, she bought it and she saw how it was helping me. Well, you know, it was good. Okay, everybody <laughs> please fill out an evaluation form for Jeff. Our fourth and final speaker this evening is Wayne Miller. Wayne H. Miller is an author, publisher, motivational speaker, and seminar leader. As a motivational consultant, Wayne's presentation is designed to inspire young and old alike to take a more proactive versus reactive role in their lives. Special emphasis is placed upon discontinuing the practice of analyzing, rationalizing, and intellectualizing their particular circumstances and beginning the process of actualiz actualizing their dreams. Please introduce and please welcome Wayne Miller with How to Take the Dis Out of Dysfunction in Your Toastmaster Organization. <laughs> challenge that will be rectified real soon. I may have to just move forward. Or not. It 
wasn't showing on my screen now. So Wayne, do you need some help? Yes, I do. I need some more help. I need help if I can get it this way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ta -da. <laughs> okay, we'll try this and we will get through this. And we'll get through it well. Hi, again, I'm Wayne H. Miller. Welcome, to my fellow Toastmasters and any welcome guests. You're probably, probably very curious about the title of my speech. And Rick, if you could go press that down on my camcorder because I forgot to do that as well. The red dot, yeah, so that it says record. And you're probably wondering, what is this title about? How to take the DYS out of dysfunction in your Toastmaster group? First of all, before we get started, we must discuss what the the dictionary definition of dysfunctional is. According to the Webster family, it's, it's an adjective and it's not performing normally as in an organ or structure of the body. It's a malfunction. And with malfunction <coughs> in mind, it's having a malfunction, malfunctioning part or element. Our entire society is dysfunctional. The reason I say that is look at the way we spell it. We spell dysfunctional D-Y-S. It should be spelled D-I-S. Everyone knows that. That in and of itself is dysfunctional. <laughs> However, be, be not dismayed because we have permission from the first family to be dysfunctional. And no, I'm not talking about the Obamas. No. <laughs> I'm talking about the first family, who was actually Adam and Eve. Uh -huh. Now why do I say they were dysfunctional? The Lord gave them specific instructions. Do not eat fruit from this tree. What does Eve do? She, was, she succumbed her will to the serpent who encouraged her to eat from the tree. She sought out dysfunctional Adam who was standing next to her and had him eat from the same tree. Well, when the Lord came down, he knew something was going on with these two dysfunctional people. And what did Adam say to him? The first thing Adam said was, the woman, she made me do it. Men, and since that day, men have been blaming things on women ever since. And you know it's true. <laughs> you probably want to ask yourself, or ask me, Wayne, how can, you, how can I tell if I'm dysfunctional? Well, if you have not spoken to a family member in three years or more, <laughs> raise your hand. No, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> I'm truly dysfunctional because I have not spoken to my younger brother in three years or so. If you hate your boss and you hate your job, but you continue to pretend that you don't, <laughs> that's dysfunctional. You operate purely on emotion versus logic or reason. We are a very emotional lot. Be mindful of that. You continue to seek outside validation. Trust me when I tell you this, we already innately know the answers to the questions that we have seeking validation for others. We all have the wisdom and we all have the knowledge. There's a story about the gods who were angry with mankind because mankind had abused wisdom and knowledge. So they were sitting around talking about where to hide wisdom and knowledge. One god said, okay, let's hide wisdom and knowledge in the deepest part of the ocean. And they, there was some discussion about that, and then they said, nah, mankind is smart enough to die for it. Further discussion, they said, well, oh, I know, let's hide wisdom and knowledge on top of the highest mountain. There was some discussion about that, then they said, nah, mankind is smart enough to climb for it. Further discussion, they said, okay, let's hide wisdom and knowledge in the deepest hole in the earth. 
So they discussed that possibility, and then they said, nah, that's not going to work. Mankind is smart enough to dig for it. <laughs> then this one little old guy who was sitting in the corner said, I know, let's hide wisdom and knowledge inside of them. They'll never seek to look for it there. And that's what they did. And that's why, I submit to you, that's why today we're always seeking outside validation when we already know the answer is right here and it's right here. If you're in a relationship with someone that you dislike or hate, that is this. <laughs> if you consider yourself to be a victim instead of a victor, that too is dysfunctional. If you never have anything good to say to anyone or about anything, and at work, if you ever notice that you're walking down a hall and someone is walking in the opposite direction and they sometimes duck into their first empty office, <laughs> that's to get away from you. You and your negative self. It, people are tired of your negativity. Trust me, think about it the last time that happened to you. Well, I know it wouldn't happen to anyone in here, but you may know someone that it happened to. And you, and you don't believe that Elvis is dead. Trust me. Elvis has been dead for years. If you're still writing him letters, that is dysfunctional. You're dysfunctional if you are in denial about being dysfunctional. How to take the DYS out of function, out of dysfunction in your Toastmaster club. Discover how thinking of self only tears down the building blocks for the foundation of your clubs. It's not about you, it's about us. Find more effective ways of communicating with peers and subordinates. This is particularly, this particularly applies to club officers. If you, I'm asking you to find more effective ways of communicating with your peers and subordinates. Find other ways of venting frustration and anger before, during, and after the Toastmaster meeting. Some of these meetings can be quite heated at times, especially when some people don't get their way. Find other ways to vent anger. Show a spirit of empathy and not a spirit of retaliation. Retaliation, of course, says, I can, I can hardly wait get that person back. No matter how long it takes, they're in trouble. I'm going to get them back. They can count on that. Understand that you are not always correct. I know there are several brainiacs that you guys work with that think that they don't do anything wrong. They're always right. And you kind of sense that about some people. But no, you're not always right. On the other hand, I am always right. <laughs> Understand that it's okay to make a mistake. We're all human. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Understand that it's not always about you. Stop being so self-absorbed and so narcissistic. Well, I can do this. I can do this better than anybody else because it's me. No, it's not about you. Apologize when you're wrong. Now, I want to add a caveat to this. Dr. Covey, who is one of my unofficial mentors, says he shares a story in his seven habits. Some of you probably remember the story he told about apologizing. He was working in his office, and I guess his kids were playing or making too much noise, and he yelled at them. And one of his youngest kids, I guess, went into his bedroom, and Dr. Covey thought he thought to himself. So he figured he'd go apologize opens the kid's door, and the first thing the kid said was, and I'm not going to accept your apology, <laughs> because you do it too much. Be ready to apologize. However, if you find yourself apologizing more often than not, people are going to wonder if your apology is sincere or not. Again, this goes back to the retaliation thing. Accept criticism without thinking to yourself, how can I get this person back? And when can I do it? How soon can I do it? And, and what, what damage can I impose upon this person? 
recognize and remove scotomas. I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room has gone through a scotoma. If you've ever gone to an eye doctor and he says, he or she says, you know, you have a blind spot in your eye. That's why you're having trouble seeing. Well, that's what a scotoma in, in life is. You ever, have you ever lost your keys? And you searched everywhere in your pocket and, and then minutes later or so, you, you, you finally see them and they're right where you left them, right where you overlooked them minutes before. That's called having a scotoma. <laughs> Recognize and understand the effect of cognitive dissonance. This term was actually coined by a guy by the name of Leon Festinger. Very interesting. What he said was that, as it relates to cognitive dissonance, is that the human mind cannot conceive two ideas at the same time, two competing ideas at the same time. When it does, it causes cognitive or thinking <coughs> dissonance or disharmony in the brain. Some of you have experienced this and didn't even know it. Maybe deciding whether to come to this meeting tonight or not. You said, yeah, I really should go, but I really don't want to go. Should go, don't want to go. Should go, but you wound, you wound up here in the first place. You experienced cognitive dissonance there. Adopt the club mission and vision as your own. Exercise critical thinking skills. Now this is something that I talk to my 16-year-old my kid about. Yes, I have a 16-year-old kid. And, and I, get, I try to get him to ask himself, is what I'm about to say or do, does it make sense? Does it make sense? And in Toastmasters, you say this to yourself because you want to make your club the most successful and respected club in Toastmasters. Leave home at home and work at work. You know how sometimes we get a little frustrated at home and even on the road and we take that frustration into work with us. We take the frustration into our Toastmasters meeting and we come home with the same frustration. Leave work at work and home at home. Don't bring that stuff into your Toastmasters meeting because we don't want to hear about it. 